or computation and only store the first and the last value. So the, the idea behind this is that um, if you, in the table that um, on hard disk is only the left and the right column, but in the computation includes all the values in between, um, you can look up any value in between without actually storing them. So the function k is always the same. And in this case, it's the A51 function. And um, say you were looking at an output of 2F06, right? Um, from this picture, we know that the secret key that went in is, is E233, but we don't, we don't uh, intuitively know that if we only store the, the, the green and the, the yellow column on the hard disk. So what we're doing is applying um, the K function, the A51, to it over and over again until we hit a value in the yellow column. So in this case, we would apply it once, look up, is the, is the 503A on the hard disk in the yellow column? No, it's not. Do it once more, and we find a value that, in fact, is on hard disk. We then go back to the green value corresponding to it, and from there, find the key that went into computing this, because it's in the same chain, right? Does this make any sense? So if, if the output you're observing over the air is anywhere in this table, the computed part of the table, not the stored part, you will find its corresponding secret key um, by doing just a couple of computations and a couple of hard disk lookups. Does that make sense? So, of course, you can, you can store this as small as you want by having these chains be longer. The longer the, the chain becomes, the smaller the table has to become because the entirety of it has to cover something like 2 to the 57 values. Now, here's the bottleneck of this um, system. To, to make this practical at all, um, the chain needs lengths somewhere um, far exceeding millions. So for each lookup now, you have millions of hard disk seeks. Of course, that is your bottleneck now. You have millions of computations at the same time, but those will be much, much faster. So some, some smart academic came along with an optimization um, to, to, to cut down on the number of hard disk seeks to get away with that bottleneck, at least, now in the breaking of, of, the, of the cipher. Um, and the way, um, the way this is working is called distinguished points, is by only storing values that, that um, have a certain pattern. In this case, the pattern is have the last eight bits be zero. So only store those on hard disk. And while you're computing, don't compute a certain number of, of chain links, but rather um, until you hit one such distinguished point, right? So now on the, at, on the attacking side again, you start with some values, say the F415, and you'll compute without looking at the hard disk until you hit a distinguished point, until you see the eight uh, zero bits, and only then you look at the hard disk, right? Much more efficient, much better balance between computing um, and hard disk six. This is way, way more optimal than, than, than the, the, the simple pre-computation attack, but still not entirely perfect, since you have a big problem with collisions. Um, collisions are places where um, if somewhere in the table, the, the same value appears twice. Now, from there on out, it will be the same deterministic, apply A5 to it over and over again until you hit the same distinguished point. So if your as your table grows, you'll get more and more redundancy in your table and eventually won't be able to add any, any useful information because everything will collide. So you have to move to more tables. You have to um, compute several tables in parallel, which, of course, if you compute n tables, makes it n times slower to find a key. And there's a trade-off. Now let me introduce another optimization to the original technique that that gets away with the collision, and then we'll combine the two. Um, and now this is finally what's called rainbow tables. Um, usually all of this is referred to as rainbow table, it's, I guess because it's such a beautiful name, but really only this is the rainbow table now. Um, in this case, you, you prevent collisions by having a different function on each link of the chain. Now, different doesn't need to be completely different. It could all be A51 with a constant, a different constant, XOT into it. So they're slightly different, but different enough from a cryptographic standpoint. Now, if 
if in two places of the table the same values appear, they won't lead to a merger and all that redundancy. Um, but rather, since the next link is most likely a different function, we'll divert again. So that's the rainbows. Unless you're hitting the same color at the same time with the same value, you won't, le you won't have a merger, right? Much, much fewer collisions. You can have much larger tables. There is, however, a downside to it, as is always with cryptography. <laughs> Instead of now um, computing, your val val uh, applying your function over and over again until you hit a certain criteria and look at the hard disk, you have to, to go through these chains multiple times. So you start um, by only applying the last um, rainbow color. Look it up on the hard disk. Then the last two. Look it up on the hard disk. Then the last three, and so forth. So as the table becomes wider, it gets exponentially more expensive to find uh, um, something in the table. So here we have a trait. Here we have an optimization that, as it's applied more, it eventually um, goes into a bad trade-off. Now that sounds like something we could we could perfectly combine with the other optimization um, that only runs into the problem of collisions. And that's, in fact, what we did. So for A51, we compute uh, a distinguished point rainbow table, where we compute a distinguished point not once, but 32 times. And each time we hit a distinguished point, we change the color. So this is drawing in the, the, the best features of both worlds. And the number 32, of course, was, was found through an optimization problem and seems optimal for the, for the 2 to the 57 key space. Um, I'll be happy to share the calculation with you if anybody's interesting. Point being, though, um, we, we did a lot of calculation to make sure you're not computing too much. This is, from, from all that's known cryptographically, the best possible pre-computation attack on A51. And now let's get back to, to the main reason why I'm standing here. We still need your computational power. Um, so the process, um, well, let me first give you a second. Well, I've already given you two reasons, I guess, for, for distributed. First, it's much faster. But second, nobody is liable for it as in one person. Um, we need this to be done anonymously, at least in part. And we need this to be distributed, preferably across different jurisdictions. Um, and the process I would propose going forward with this is get the tools, of course, they're online. You can, you can read the, the documentation and all that, and then start cracking on these tables. There isn't even any coordination needed. We don't need to exchange emails unless somebody doesn't understand the software, say, which might very well be the case. So we'll, <laughs> we might need to go through some code revision or documentation stages. But unless that's the case, you don't need any input from us. Generate two random numbers. Um, and start crunching on these tables. Eventually, once you're done, put the tables on BitTorrent, um, through Tor preferably, so there's no way of tracing the tables back to any one person. Once we hit something like a terabyte of tables, um, we have a good chance of decrypting um, a lot of GSM um, packets. Eventually, the goal is to have something around three terabytes by the end of this year. Right? Does that sound doable? I mean, we're a bunch of people. If everybody computed five gigabyte on, on 80 nodes, something like that, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be done soon. OK, well, that's, that's my proposal for the process. But of course, it's your software now. It's GPL. So do with it whatever you want. Any optimization is welcome. Um, we want you to be involved, of course, not just as, as computational resources, but as developers as well. Um, we did build this framework to be as flexible as pos possible, both in the number of backends it supports. So I've been talking about Qt and FPGAs. CPUs are supported, of course, as well. Um, and it's flexible for more possible backends. It is flexible as, as in the cryptographic function to be used as well. So if you have any other cipher with 64-bit or, or less of a key space, you can adopt this very, very quickly um, to, to just suit your your project pre-computation needs. So please get involved both in the, on the computation side and as developers. Um, Sasha has been, has been spending a lot of time developing this, and it's a beautiful framework. And it, it would be a pity if 